and she lays down with him, but the hole to hell is still there. <laughs> Cuts to a contractor the next day. This is not good. This is going to cost. <laughs> this is not going to be cheap. <laughs> Whoa, this is gonna cost you. Eli, would you take uh, Hall to Hell in your ba- in your basement over what's been happening in your <laughs> oh, basement? Yeah, what's really, that? honestly. <laughs> Are you kidding? The devil and I have so much in common. He'd be like, I love your recordings, man. We all sort of gather near the hole, getting in early on the I'm a patron. <laughs> <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because anything is an improvement over these fucking political ads. I'm your host, <laughs> No Illusions. Heath is off this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Enjoying my Tide commercials in deep blue New Jersey. Yeah, no right. Oh, I was in England for a while, and they're just like, I like Nutella with my crumpets. And I'm like, yes, yes. these are ads I can get behind. And also speaking of England, also joining us this week is the editor of Skeptic Magazine, project director of the Good Thinking Society, co-host of Skeptics with a K, and co-organizer of Earth's Best Skeptical Conference, Michael Marshall Marsh. Welcome back. Oh, do you guys have an election coming up? We hear yes. nothing about it over here. <laughs> we have I've never even heard that you have an election. I've no idea who's running. We get none of your news or information <laughs> dominating our news and information 24-7. Yeah. Oh, is, I'm sorry. Is it that you would like to talk about the political situation in England more? <laughs> is that it, Marsh? You want to discuss how it's going over there? I mean, these days, yes. Come yeah, right, right, you guys right, have yeah. got. Yeah, we've had yeah, election. Well, fair. Just take your election. Just have a shorter election. Have you guys thought of this? This is the shorter <laughs> election, though. We did that this time. Like that is do. true. This that is, is so. true. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us, Marsh, it, 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 other than our election, what will we be breaking down today? <laughs> uh, so we watched The Deliverance. It's the inspired by a true story of a young mother of three who has to battle demonic possession when what she'd really prefer to be doing is abusing her children, apparently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's like The Exorcist, but where the demon is only the second most evil thing in the movie. <laughs> really? Okay, here's the realization I had about four minutes before the end of this movie. There is a good argument to be made that this movie is about a demon's attempt to rescue children <laughs> from their abusive mother. Yeah, yeah, God. that's very accurate. Because yeah. think about it, the demon gets them taken out of the house and then beats the shit out of her. Things that I also wanted yeah. to do watching no, right. this movie. <laughs> yep. I won't spoil too much of the ending, but at the end, she has a fight with the demon. I was rooting for the demon <laughs> 100%. with my oh, yeah. whole yeah. heart to see. Yep. <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you loved your first sleepover at a friend's house with a dysfunctional family, but you wish there was actual child endangerment being used as a spooky haunted house the whole time, you will love this movie. Mm. It's like if you got to the end of Splash Mountain and they were like, and that's what it was like to be Captain Phillips. That's what this movie <laughs> looks like. <laughs> no, this, look, this might have been the most offensive. Maybe it was a ghost in our tenure as film critics. And we did Exorcism of Emily Rose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that is true. And also, like, it is, it says it's inspired by a true story. And that's right in the sense that. It is true that she told this story to explain why her children had so many mysterious bruises. So yep. this is a true story that she told to explain. <laughs> yeah. True lie. It's yeah. a true lie that a lady told. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah. I want to go with best worst. Oh, shit. Is that the time? We better get on with this movie. Right? <laughs> we, we get an hour in and it's just this kind of slightly boring family drama about, uh, amongst like very unlikable characters. And there's not a great deal of spooky stuff going on to the point where I was starting to worry that you've made me watch another film we can't use for Gap. I was genuinely worried about that. I mean, spooky stuff came in, rescued the whole thing, but I was worried for a while. You make Marsh watch one 90-minute documentary on Bitcoin and all of a sudden he's Mr. Shaky (laughs) over here. (laughs) All right, so I'm going to go with, maybe we've already kind of touched on this, but I'm going to go with the best worst science can't explain it. Right, because every demon movie needs a moment where that, like, the doctors examine them and they're like, well, there's nothing physically wrong with them at all. This movie has to reach the furthest over its shoulder to get to its ass of any movie we've ever seen do that. 
Yes. Yeah. The Wikipedia article for the haunting this is based on has a section called skeptical explanation. It, it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> And I'm going to go with best worst villain. As we've teased, the villain of this movie is Child Protective Services. Yep, it is. Right? Now, again, I just want to be clear. Like, Child Protective Services is in a lot of movies trying to take kids away from a mother who isn't abusive. In this movie, Child Protective Services is taking kids away from a mother who is abusive, yep. and they still do the spooky music when this woman shows up at the door. <laughs> you should yeah. the fuck too. <laughs> All right. Well, with Marcia's assurance in advance that there will be a horror movie in here somewhere, we're going to pause for a quick break. And when we come back, we'll dive into all the child endangerment that is The Deliverance. Haunted Hauschowitz. Oh, amazing. I mean, it writes itself. Right? Hey, uh, movie writers who write horror movies based on supposedly true stories. Do you? You guys got a second? Sure. Yeah, man. What's up? I, I was just headed out for donuts and I couldn't help but notice that the next movie you guys are working on is about the Latoya Ammons haunting. That sure is, yeah. So you guys are aware that that lady very clearly was just abusing her kids and used demonic possession as an excuse, right? Oh, yeah, no, of course, obviously. Like, like they were examined by several doctors and psychologists who verified that there were not any demons, that these were sick Sick kids. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, even if they had believed her, demons aren't real. Yeah. Aren't real. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what I was going to say is, like, if you make a movie about her story from her perspective, you, you will be explicitly covering for a child abuser. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Yeah. And you guys are sure there isn't a hell for us to go to? Yeah, man. We're sure. Okay. Okay. I got it. Because if anyone deserves no, to go... There is to, no hell, man. Got it. Got it. You guys want a donut? Oh, do they have a bear claw? Yeah. Get your bear claw. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. There's Pug Monthly, Pug Annual, Pug Lover Magazine. Yeah. For the last time, Eli, I get it. But do you get it, though? Hey, guys. Like, yeah. what, what are you doing? Uh, Eli's trying to convince me to hold QED in the Pug Cafe next year. I'm saying he could double his audience. I, did you hear all those magazines, Marsh? Yeah, I'm not sure that that's the crossover we're exactly looking for. But but Eli, that's so many subscriptions. How do you make sure you're not being charged by a pug subscription that you don't use? Why, with Rocket Money, of course. What's Rocket Money? Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps find and cancel your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills so you can grow your savings. Wait, they help you lower bills? They sure do, Marsh. Rocket Money automatically scans your bills to find opportunities to save. Then you can ask them to negotiate for you. They'll deal with customer service. Fantastic. It sure is. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of 500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. You know what, Eli? I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash awful movies. That's rocketmoney.com slash awful movies. Rocketmoney.com slash awful movies. All right, Eli. Thanks. Oh, did I say pug yearly? Is that different from pug annual? Yeah, they split over editorial differences. Ah, oh, you hate to see it. You really do? Mm -hmm. And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to open up on a quote that doesn't have an attribution. I think it's because of racism, because the guy who said it was Chinese, but I don't know. But it's I, I need forgiveness for my sins, but also deliverance from the power of sin. Yeah. It was nice, though, because you knew this was Jesus-y. This was not a doll situation. We're going full <laughs> Jesus in this bad boy. Yeah, but also that quote is kind of like, forgive me, but like it totally wasn't my fault. If sin is so powerful, yes. it's, not, it's not on me. Right. And then uh, the next line that comes up on screen is, I need forgiveness for what I have done, but deliverance from what I am. And I wrote the Eli Bosnick story. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get the, of course, inspired by true events <laughs> claim, which is a double lie because it's Christian and a haunted house story. So yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and then we get the most shocking and frightening moments of the entire fucking movie. In the credits, we see the name Glenn Close. Yeah, Glenn Close. Eight 
Time Academy Award nominee Glenn fucking close. What? Like what happened? Yes. I I, I can't even imagine. I Who spent the entire movie trying to imagine. <laughs> Yeah, because like when this when Glenn Close came up, I thought, oh fuck, this might just be a good film. Yep, because it also comes up Omar Epps, the guy from House. And I thought, okay, I know mm-hmm. that guy as well. This is two yeah. actors that I know now. This might be a good film. This might be a worry. It isn't. It's fine. Nope. It's a terrible film. But I was worried for a moment there. No, and they enter this movie like when Wizard of Oz was in color. Right. Like the moments that they're in them, there are real actors. But then the camera pans back over to the other actor being like, I'll tell you what, I ain't haunted by no ghosts today for sure. (laughs) No, honestly, like generally speaking, the casting of this movie was way too good for the script of this film. You know, just even setting aside Glenn Close and Omar Epps. Yeah. All right. So we're starting our movie off in Pittsburgh in 2011 with this kid painting a Batman mural. Why a Batman mural? Why? Because I had just gotten an amazing VR Batman game the previous day (laughs) that I wasn't allowing myself to play because I had to watch this stupid fucking movie. (laughs) So the very first scene, the kid's in a goddamn Batman shirt painting a goddamn Batman mural. He is. He puts is. on a VR headset. Oh, wow, this is so much better than the movie you're watching. Right. But the thing is, he almost could have put on a VR headset because this movie set in the past is 2011. It's like the t- 2011 can't be the past. That's like when <laughs> London did the Olympics. That is not like set this in the past, your period piece kind of thing. <laughs> oh, they've got iPhones. They will have iPhones and yep. not even the first iPhone. Nope. These are later model iPhones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. It's set in 2011. They're already <laughs> talking about needing the newest iPhone. It's yeah. so sad. <laughs> and I should point out that like the demonology of this movie will reflect the modernity of this movie, right? Yep. Long gone are the days when it was like, and then things flew around the room. It's like, trust me, it was a demon. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I was in the basement in a fist fight with myself, that's what I thought. Thank yeah, you very right, much. right. So this, this kid, this is the youngest of three kids. This is Andre. And he calls his mom up to show her his finished mural. And she's like, yeah, pretty good, I guess. Fine. It's fine. (laughs) Yeah. She gives him a meh. Mm. Yep. (laughs) So to the point where you assume that like somebody died uh, very recently and this character is supposed to still be in mourning. But no, she just doesn't give a shit about her kid's Batman (laughs) mural. I mean, that's fair. Because if you look at some of the, the, the characters he's drawn, one of them is a family with what looks like their pet gingerbread man. So like that is not <laughs> great talent. I, yeah. Maybe she's just like, look, kid, you're going to have to at some point choose your lane and this and painting is not your lane. No, so let's not yeah. encourage this too early. Let's Why go, would there have you be tried a... the flute? Here's a recorder. Let's get you into some music <laughs> or something. So, okay, but then we cut to Glenn Close at her otherwise black church and she's just looking like the inside of Donald Trump's drain trap with all that bronzer. Oh, uh, and she, she look. stands out at this evangelical church exactly like, and in the same way that I stand out, stood out when I went to see the Peter Popov show in London. It's like, <laughs> oh, I should have thought about the demographics here. I am going to be obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And unlike Marsh, she's trying to play, she's like clapping. She's like, yep, I belong here. <laughs> this is also where we get our first scene with her minister. And this minister seems to be faking her way through Lazarus. Like she didn't read the homework. Yes. Mm. Like she's pretty sure she knows the story of Lazarus, but she's waiting for the crowd to agree before she gives details. She's like, and Lazarus died. And everyone's like, woo. She's like, yeah, he fucking died. Exactly. (laughs) 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 And yeah, so, so we get that. And then we get Glenn Close eating dinner with the otherwise black family. Right. So she is, I guess, supposed to be the grandmother of this family. Her daughter is Ebony and Ebony's children are Andre's the youngest. And then the daughter Shanti is the middle kid. And then Nate is the oldest son. Yeah, Nate is the kid from Stranger Things. So yeah, like he's yeah. He, he's very much like carving a niche in the uh, in in his career of just around spooky stuff. You want Nate from uh, or, the, or this guy from Stranger Things? Yeah, yeah, Lucas. Yeah, yeah. And this movie is so sure our dicks are going to be blown off by a mixed family. They keep being like, "That's right, you're my daughter." My blood daughter. And I'm like, yeah, man. Why do you keep saying it like that <laughs> movie? <laughs> right. But think about it then. Like, Glenn Close is white. Her daughter's black. And her, and so this, this lady names her black baby 
Ebony. That is yeah. way on the nose for you, White mm-hmm. Lady. Like, pick a different name. And it's not even like, so I spent the whole movie assuming that that was just like the name of the person that this was based on in real life, but it's not. The it's actor not. decided not. to rename this African-American character Ebony. Mm. Yeah. All the names, so I checked, there's a black writer and a white writer on this movie. I promise you, white writer handled all the names <laughs> because they, they changed all the names and all the names are exactly what you would ask a white guy who wrote this movie to name black characters. Yes. Yeah. Ebony. A white guy who who saw the first few episodes of the first series of The Wire but couldn't get into the dialogue so didn't watch any more of the rest of it. Yeah, he exactly. named the characters in this, yeah. Yeah, so, and we're supposed to be getting this scene where Glenn Close and her daughter, you can see that they have a troubled relationship but the way that this writer handles that is that they just go, you know what? Fuck you. What? You will fuck you. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> There's zero seconds into this scene before she yells, shut the fuck up at her. And I was like, weird Christian movie. Weird. <laughs> also, like the, the criticism. Shit, so this, this argument blows up over the food. And Glenn Close, apparently what she hates about the food, you know, Ebony is saying, oh, there you go again with your too much garlic criticism. That's a weird subject for an ongoing family of food. <laughs> that you've overdone the cloves. <laughs> but like, I get it because my, my dad actually genuinely refused to have any garlic in the house when I was growing up because he didn't want, quote, any of that foreign stuff in the house. (laughs) Garlic does grow wild in the forest near my village, but apparently that is too far afield for my dad's uh, culinary taste. Literally too far afield. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) There's also this great moment here where the kid asks for another glass of milk and she's like, no, you're lactose intolerant. And he's like, I'm not lactose intolerant. You're just cheap. (laughs) Yeah, which is a great moment until the mom abuses, physically abuses him for this, right? Yeah, punches him straight in the face. Yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. Also, it is weird that she's too cheap to give him milk. They're feeding them catfish. Is catfish with too much garlic not like, that sounds like quite a pricey meal. I don't know how cheap catfish is, but milk is pretty cheap. (laughs) <laughs> it's one of the cheapest staples for sure. But yeah, this is where she hits the kid. And this is where I wrote for the first, but definitely not the last time in my notes. Literally anything that happens to her for the rest of the movie is fine by me. Yeah. Yes. Well, so Glenn Close gets up all indignant and I'm like, hey, she just set up the rules that you're allowed to hit your kid and she's your kid. Hit her. <laughs> hit, hit her. Hit her. Oh, man. If she just power bombed her on the <laughs> kitchen table. So many ways this movie could have been better. I did want the child to respond to being hit in the face by like shitting violently because he actually was lactose intolerant. I did want that to happen. It didn't happen, but yeah, I did want it. So, okay. So then it's that night. The sister, Shante, is is texting with her dad about when he's going to be at home. He's stationed in Iraq. Yeah, and she's texting with the keyboard sounds and the message delivery sounds on. So this is officially a horror film by this point. <laughs> <laughs> All she needs to do is be behind Marsh on the train and it's the scariest <laughs> right. possible movie. She's also got the keyboard on her phone. It's a small detail, but the keyboard on her phone is zoomed into specifically big enough that my dad can see it from Iraq. That is how yeah. zoomed in <laughs> that keyboard is. And then she, and she, I guess she shares a room with her brothers. She goes, which one of you farted? Spoiler, that's demon fart that she's smelling there. It that's is. that's yeah. what Sorry, we're setting up. That's me. <laughs> but we don't know that at this point. So it's just weird that this scene kind of comes to an end with the kids apparently having farted so badly that like loads of flies are attracted. And I thought that is, before I knew that this was leading to demon, that's a very weird detail that it's like, they just fart and then attract flies is kind of what these kids have got going on. Yes. Yeah. And well, look, guys, as long as the movie doesn't later explain why there would be flies and a bad smell in this house, I think we can all agree this is very demon and scary. <laughs> very <laughs> demonic. Yeah. No, that's how the scene goes. We we hear her go, who farted? And then we see mom downstairs adding up bills with a calculator like you do. Christian in a movie. Christian film. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> exactly. And there are flies buzzing all over the place and we're like, Wow, that was an Eli-level fart. (laughs) But of course, we also know that like buzzing flies fuck specifically with Eli's misophonia. So this movie was like revenge against Eli, like by himself, right? Eli avenging himself. And they did it constantly throughout the movie. Every time I would put my headphones back in and stop listening, like just use my computer speakers, they'd be like, oh, look, the flies are back. (laughs) (laughs) They're in your ears. (laughs) Is that my daughter in there? But it's, it's so loud. But like, she just looks up and then suddenly notices. But did she not notice there were like a thousand flies just knocking around her spooky basement? Did she only just spotted this? Yeah. There's an entire plague of flies. And they're coming from the basement. And I had the early theory that 
the dad was dead and rotting in the basement and all of the texts oh. that the daughter was receiving were from his ghost. I thought that's where we're going to go with this. It isn't. That would have been a good, a good move. So, so much, much better. better. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, and so mom sees that there are a bunch of flies, like a corpse level of flies, and she just closes the basement door. <laughs> She's she like, does, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to deal with a corpse right now. I got bills to pay. Out of sight, out of mind. Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. So, but late that night, Dre wakes up and he goes down to the fridge in his underwear and chugs a whole gallon of milk. Well, he mostly pours it on the floor around him, but some of it he chugs. Yeah. So this kid, he really, really wants to drink about a third of a carton of milk, but like evenly sampled throughout the carton. That's the only explanation. <laughs> exactly. Yes, really yes, drinking exactly. Right, right. Well, and again, this is supposed to be the first demon thing that the demon makes him do besides fart, I guess, or make the smell. So again, my pet theory that this is about a demon trying to save a kid, right? Just waking him up being like, hey, kid, you can have some milk. Your mom's a fucking <laughs> asshole. Oh, God, yeah. Get on down there, kiddo. I'm going to I'm gonna beat your mom up at the end of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Eli's going to give me a standing ovation. Yeah, while, right. While right I beat exactly. your mom up. And- you just wanted, like, at the end of this scene, while he, he finishes drinking the milk, and you see his hair tussle a little bit, and it's the demon. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Go on, kid. <laughs> All right. <laughs> two stories and then bedtime, okay? Two. That's two. But then he goes downstairs, it goes outside, and he stares a bird to death. Yeah, or he sees a dead bird, which would be even less climactic. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, like the bird smashes into the window, I think, for some reason. But we don't know why. Oh, is that? Yeah, yeah. he looks, like, he doesn't even blink when we see like the bird smash into the window and crack the window. It actually yeah, even cracks the window. That doesn't oh, come back that. in any way. And I don't think the window's cracked at any other point in this film. I actually know why that bird is there. It's part of child bird detective services. What? That's not even... <laughs> the pro and bird? Are you... Bird detective. I don't... Okay. <laughs> People are rolling at home, guys. No, they're not. Don't I cut don't... that. I try to... Oh, I... They're... I... Was... they're wiping tears from their eyes. Yeah. They're... Oh. Okay. So, if you want your child protective services t-shirt, you go don't. to child protective <laughs> services. Don't. So, okay. So the next day, Ebony, so it, we're going to ignore, by the way, not just the dead bird and the crack in the window and everything, but also the milk, right? Nobody's ever going to respond to the fact that there's not milk or that there's milk poured all over the fucking floor. All over the floor, like literally like a litre of milk all over the floor. No wonder there's flies all over this house. Yes. If there's just milk being poured all over the kitchen floor and nobody does anything about it. Well, you know what? Later, we're going to do that same thing, but with a dead body in this movie. So I guess the milk <laughs> is not the... We'll forget about that eventually. So Ebony is now on the phone with a bill collector trying to talk him down or something, right? She should have used rocket money. Yeah. And then we see the kids around the corner bullying Nate, the older brother, on his way to school. This is completely irrelevant to the larger story as well. It will not come back. The only reason it's worth mentioning is because later in this scene, she goes and kicks that guy in the nuts. Yeah, that Uh is true. Yeah, yeah. The only nice thing she does for her children in the movie, and it's just a chance to be violent. Yeah, she just likes hitting. Kick another child in the nuts. Yeah. So, but while she's cleaning the house up and, and talking to the person who's trying to repossess her car, she finds a bottle of vodka and a wad of money in Nate's closet. Right. And the way she finds it is weird because she's trying to hang shirts on the rail in the closet. But when she tries to put one on, she can't get the shirt to go onto the rail. She like the rail, the the, the hanger doesn't go over the rails. It's like, is the bottle of vodka stopping the shirt going on the rail? Like the fact that there's a bottle of vodka (laughs) on the shelf, like two, three feet below. Yeah. Yeah. So, but she, she finds it. She goes downstairs to confront Nate as he's getting home from school about it. But this is where she realizes that the bullies are picking on him. And she's like, hey, hitting my kids is my thing. Yeah, right. Exactly. I'm the only one who's allowed to beat up my kids, damn it. So she goes and kicks that kid in the nuts. Yeah, she does go and just hit another child. It is a different child that she hits. Yeah, right. like yeah. Most of her, her character work is hit is which child she's hitting at which point. Yeah. Uh-huh. So she kicks that kid in the nuts, talks some shit to him. The kick in the nuts. Did we all did we all cheer when you kicked him in the nuts? Because the thing oh, is, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. She kicks him the ball so hard, even the soundtrack felt it. Because the, the music stopped dead <laughs> at the point of impact. Like, yes, the, like uh... the guy playing the uh, the violin in the background has gone, ooh. <laughs> oh, she got you there. So yeah, so she, then she goes back and Glenn Close tells her she's being a very bad mother. And I'm like, that's the best mothering she's done so far in the movie, though. <laughs> yeah. Right there. Yeah, she's like, you were a bad mom. And it's like, that actually doesn't preclude you from being a bad mom. Like, I'm right. sure your mom was a bad mom because you're you, but that also, the you can stop 
being a bad mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Doesn't excuse your bad momery. Yeah, but Ebony tells Glenn that her Christianity is bullshit real quick. Then she'll do that a few more times before it's over. And then mm -hmm. Ebony goes out back for a joint. Now, Dre, the younger son, is he's demon chanting to an invisible friend. And it takes mom way too long to acknowledge this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, in, but in fact, we hear the fly sound effect at the same time, which makes it seem like the kid is just having a chat with some flies. Like the flies <laughs> have like moved in. He's making friends. He's like being neighborly. I think that's, that's, that's what I assumed was happening here. Yeah. Fly old protective service. Okay. That's, so that's, that wait, that's closer. We're getting we'll, there. Yay! We'll iterate our way into a pun. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'll have a joke by the end of this podcast <laughs> yet, damn it. So, okay. So then we we cut to the family watching TV. Public domain movies is their favorite genre. <laughs> They're watching public domain movies and they know them all by heart. They've mm. memorized this movie from like the 60s or whatever. Yeah. Oh, God, it's so rough watching Glenn Close do this and just doing the, the any of the script, like every line that she says is terrible to the point where I came up with a new theory at this point, which is that Glenn Close is actually possessed by a demon, like in real life, not the character, <laughs> oh. but in real life. And that's how she ended up with this career okay. move. All yeah. right, yeah, this is this is the demon's version of turning her head 360 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Siskel's final revenge. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so they they do some lines from this movie and this is where Ebony's like, hey, Shante, maybe we can't afford to do your birthday this, this year. And Shante yells at her for being poor and, and goes upstairs. They will actually afford to do her birthday mm -hmm. this year. Yep, so they this will. scene is really just another chance for the movie to show us that Ebony is a bad mom. Yes. yes. And terrible yeah. with money. Absolutely terrible with money. Yeah. So, okay. So that night we get Dre going down into the basement to check out whatever rotting ass corpse is drawing flies to it. Again, it, like we've seen characters now three times go, oh, wow, a lot of flies in the basement. Better close that door. Right. <laughs> then we get mom coming downstairs and just like looking around to see if maybe there's a horror movie going on here. Damn it, is there a plot down here? No. <laughs> she's right. strafing around the house like she's the first person shooter. At some point, she's like moving sideways. It's, yeah. it's a very <laughs> old way of getting around. Yeah. Corner peaks. <laughs> but also, so there's a moment here where she's like, the basement door is open, but it was closed just a moment ago. And we're like, really, is that what we're is that what we're going for? Is that what we've got so far? <laughs> a child drinking milk he's not allowed and a door that was open. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> So, okay, then we cut to Glenn Close trying on different wigs. This is where we sort of, where, where we surprise everybody with the she has cancer moment. Yeah, we've got mm -hmm. Cancer Mom, Christian movie. We're taking all the boxes here. It's good. Yep. Yep, yep. So she, we get her, she, she goes in for her chemo where she flirts with Omar Epps for a bit. She sexually harasses Omar really? Epps homophobically. Mm. Yeah. Oh, she you're says, right. She does. Ask me out or you're gay. And Omar Epps is like, I would like a dick to suck. <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a weird moment because like there's other cancer patients in the cancer ward and they are just being pissy about the fact that she's showing off too much cleavage while receiving chemo. And do those, I, I assume those conversations don't happen, that people are like <laughs> catty about how attractive <laughs> the other cancer patients look. Oh, God. I love, Marsh, that you accidentally said chemo, which is like <laughs> the cleavage version of chemo. Chemo, so, yeah. <laughs> that's what she gets. <laughs> I don't know much about chemo, but if they put you next to other people that you have to make small talk with, I would like to argue right now that that is the worst part of having cancer. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so she goes to leave after she gets a date with Omar Epps and they stop her to tell her she's behind on her chemo payments. And I'm like, yeah, Marsh, this is how it works. They repo the chemo. This is the scariest bit of this fucking movie that you're going to see. The American healthcare system. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely for sure. But we don't even get a good, like, accurate representation of the American healthcare system because it turns out she's off her insurance and the daughter's been paying, I get out of pocket for chemo. And we find yep. out her daughter works at a salon, just a just, like, yeah. perfectly good job. But it's not pay out of pocket for chemotherapy levels nope. of work, I don't imagine. Sure, the fuck yeah. isn't. Yeah. Well, and, and she, like, as she's gone out, she's like, oh, it must be the Medicare. They're like, oh, we don't take Medicare. It's been your daughter that's been paying for it. And I'm like, Instead of using Medicare, this, this is just dumb. 
Like, I'm sorry. Like, I know she likes this chemo, but unless you've got the money to do it, that's just dumb. This one's like six blocks closer to the house. You understand? <laughs> that's why I have to deny my daughter a birthday party. <laughs> yes, right. So, okay. Then we see Ebony walking home late that night and Glenn has to confront. Like, I, So now that we know that Glenn Close has cancer, she can look like it, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. She can be dressed like she has cancer. She's dressing extra cancery as well, just to make the point at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And we've also established at this point that Ebony is an alcoholic. So she's coming home drunk, but she's like, it's okay. I didn't drive. I walked home. So it's oh, it's all right. And I'm like, well, that was very responsible of her. So. I think the movie wanted us to give way more credit for that than we thought. <laughs> like, this abu like we were supposed to be like, look, she might physically abuse her children and be financially irresponsible, but she took an Uber. Yes. Yeah. Did Great not drunk drive. Yeah. Protagonist. <laughs> Yeah, so, so but Glenn confronts her about making her chemo payments and, and she's like, how dare you? And she's like, I, I did. And she's like, oh, that's I guess that's the scene then. They didn't write any more dialogue for us. <laughs> Will this affect other moments in the no, movie? No, no, no we'll no, actually no, never no, talk no, about it no, again. No yeah. Oh, no. Huh. So Ebony goes upstairs, she passes out and she dreams that more interesting shit is happening in the movie. And they only left this in because this is one of the few things that were reported yes. by the actual true, like the true case was like, oh, I was lying down once and I had a dream someone was in my house. So, you know, demonic possession and not just yep. regular dream, just a regular dream. You're telling dream. me yeah. <laughs> dreaming about a person isn't perfect evidence of demonic possession, Marsha? I mean, sometimes skepticism goes too far. Where is your, where's your curiosity? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, where's your nickel when you need him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and she runs out of the bedroom with a bat yelling, who's in my house? And I'm like, well, Glenn Close and your three children, so be careful with that fucking bat. Yeah, yeah. you know that there are four <laughs> other people living here, plus a whole load of flies as well. So right, I, you yeah. Know I, I actually, at this point, because we're seeing the flies again, I had a new theory that she's paying for all that chemo by illegally subletting the basement to all those flies. Like, oh, all those flies are paying rent. Yeah. Well, that would make sense, because as she walks by, she literally mumbles to herself, damn basement door and then she <laughs> shuts it again. <laughs> so, but once again, she doesn't check on the source of the flies. She just locks the door and then she goes to vomit in the sink in case this wasn't unpleasant enough to listen to. It's a very casual vomit as well. It's sort of like, oh, there's a sink here. I might as well make use of it. Like, like she could have <laughs> held it in, but it was just convenient. I could vomit. I could <laughs> vomit, vomit right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, well, I'm at the vomitorium. <laughs> have a cheeky little vomit then. Why not? <laughs> ah, you've been a good girl. Have a little vomit. <laughs> so <laughs> that's Andy. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but then she gets done with her vomit and, and she looks up and Nate, her oldest son, is just staring weirdly at her. And uh, he wants to know where the fuck his wad of money is, right? Right. So she's like, well, where'd you get money from? And he's like, I, I just, I had, my dad sent it to me probably. We don't know. It doesn't fucking matter to the movie. And then she hits him. Again. Mm. He hits her back. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Then Dre runs in to help his brother and he falls over and hits himself. Which I assume he slipped on a puddle of milk, Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. right, right, probably. And look, this is not intended to be a hilarious series of Rube Goldberg injuries, <laughs> but that's what it is, though. It's, it's what so it good. is. I right. wanted every single member of the cast to walk into that room and fall over. Like, Glenn Close comes in, <laughs> yeah. Omar X comes in, just every single person. It's a big pile on the floor. Yeah. My cooking oil. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Each of the flies comes in and somehow falls over. <laughs> yeah. Mew, mew, mew. It's really hard to trip them. You've got six legs. You've got to trip yeah. each leg independently. <laughs> More like slide protective services. What? Am I right? Um, so, <laughs> but here's the other thing about all these scenes, right? All these scenes are very clearly this abusive mom's excuse yes. that she later made up, right? Yes. She hit her kids, right? She threw her kids around the kitchen. She deserves the death penalty. And now these movie makers are making it like part of their spooktacular. I can't emphasize enough how much I dislike that. Yeah. yeah. No, it's straight up fucking evil. Yeah, it really is. They might as well make a movie about how, like, the Jews keep getting pushed into these ovens at our friendly oh, day camp. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but so 
then we get the next scene where she gives Nate his money back. Apparently, she did just steal her kid's fucking money. Yeah. Yeah. She puts it in his bedside drawer. His drawer, I counted, his drawer contains nine Crayola crayons and a condom. That is mixed messages, if ever I've seen it. <laughs> so, for you, maybe. <laughs> Right, but but this is supposed to be a redeeming moment from her for her. Like, right, she's got all these bills, but even then, she didn't steal any of her kids' money. Okay, yeah, she comes in. She apologizes for being an abusive alcoholic. So you know, she's trying. Yeah, almost in those words as well. The dialogue is so bad in this entire thing. The the entire drama here feels so reductive. It it feels like they took inspiration from American fiction, but only from the fake book that Monk publishes <laughs> as a satire on <laughs> yes, the Black Experience. Exactly. Oh, yes. that's what we're watching. We're watching the film adaptation of adaptation that book. Adaptation of yeah, his yeah, book. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tyler Perry passed on this one. <laughs> So then we get like, I guess they've called somebody about the flies. So we get the guy who goes down into their basement to get the rotting cat corpse out. Yeah. Which would explain the flies then. Well, yep. It's perfect. Information. Like, why did nobody look to see where all the flies in the basement are coming from? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and then he, the guy comes out and he's like, it'll be $60. And they're like, we don't have $60. And he's like, I'm going to put the dead cat back then. And I'm like, well, well, now they know it's a dead cat and where it is. This isn't fucking Ghostbusters. Like, sure, put it back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, they, they should just follow him in. As right. He puts it, as soon as they put it on the floor, they just pick it straight back up again. Yeah, yeah. it's just like, I got a trash bag Shit, here. Now I owe you $60. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but mom doesn't have the money. Nate's like, well, you don't put the dead cat back there. I'll give you $60 out of my wad of money. And just as he's getting the money for the for the guy... Who should pull up outside but Monique? Ugh, yuck. Child Protective Services is here to break up this super chill family. Yep. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Monique plays the character of Cynthia, who is, I guess, mom was in jail and she's like on probation or something. And Cynthia is the Child Protective Services social worker that is looking after her kids. And we learn in this scene that like mom moved without telling Cynthia where she was going. Yeah, I believe the court calls that fleeing. Yes, <laughs> fleeing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But Glenn Close, like when, when Cynthia comes in, like Glenn Close bows up like she's going to kick Monique's ass. Right? But she storms out. All the kids come in. And then this is where we we have the first of several, hey, would you like to explain all these bruises on your children? Moments. Of the movie. Which is such a weird thing because like, are we meant to think, because she she tries to say, oh, I don't know where this came from. These came from somewhere else and this was school. But like, we have seen her beating her kids. We've seen you hit your kids. Are we meant to think like, oh, she's telling the truth, but it looks bad. Because like, we saw you doing each of these things. You punched your kid in the face at one point. Right. The movie doesn't want us to sympathize with child protective services. Right. What they want us to do is watch this scene and go, well, Child Protective Services isn't giving this actually abusive parent nearly enough credit for the hitting she's not doing. <laughs> well, th- but I don't know that they are. OK, because because like if that's what they wanted to do, then they could show these kids getting these injuries. Yeah. But we don't we don't know what they're right. Like so the 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 Cynthia turns to Shantae and goes, hey, what are all those bruises on your arm? And we look and it looks like, you know, somebody's grabbed her by the arm really hard. But we never saw that happen. Yeah, I have no idea what those were. Which, which, it, if they're setting up that that was a demon, show that. Yes. Or if they're setting up that it's the mom, show that. But it's it's a mystery to us, and we're meant to be the ones who actually are sympathetic here. Yeah, it's right. awful filmmaking. This is how desperate this movie is to make the CPS lady look bad. At one point, they do this long lingering shot of her putting her feet up on the furniture, like we're supposed to be like pretty rude, huh? Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Really? Shoes on the couch? Yeah. While you're trying to protect these children? <laughs> Isn't it a reclining chair as well, though? It yep. is a recliner. It's, it is like, yeah, it's, it's not even... close as reclining chair. Yep. Like that, that is what that chair is meant to it be. Is. It's not even feet on the bed. Yeah, it's yeah. not even shoes on the bed level <laughs> route. Because, again, while this woman was being interviewed or whatever for this movie, and she was like, oh, and you know another thing that was rude about Child Protective Services when they were stopping me from abusing my kids? She put her feet up. Yep. Yep. Like, she lived there. Come yep. on. Guest. So yeah, but so she's asking about the bruises and why is Andre all hunched over like somebody hit him in the stomach last night? She's like, as he slipped on a fly and some milk. It was a, it was a <laughs> we saw it was a Rube Goldberg thing. 
And then Cynthia goes to leave and there's some lady that we've never met, like a parked across the street, staring at them. She'll be important or something. <laughs> She'll make sure this is a horror movie, damn it. Yeah, like I swear there's a horror movie in this shit somewhere, but I'll be damned if we're going to find it before we take our first break because we're already there and not a goddamn thing has happened. But maybe something will happen when we return for even more of The Deliverance. Okay, uh, what about this then? Nah, I think he's got one of those. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, what you doing? Oh, hey Noah, we were just setting up to do our holiday shopping, but all these gift websites are kind of samey. Yeah, it all feels like just cheap plastic crap, really. Yeah, or drop-shipped cheap plastic crap. Yeah. I kind of wish there was a website where you could get, like, you know, homemade and unique gifts from an actual person, not a company. Well, why don't you try Uncommon Goods? You mean, like, body parts of dead celebrity? No! I don't mean that this is their first ad on the show. That's not what I mean. When you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. Many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches, so shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S. They have the most meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. Wow, amazing. It sure is, Marsh. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they'll give $1 back to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. So wait, I can support independent businesses while doing good for my favorite charities? What's next? 15% off? To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash awful. That's uncommongoods.com slash awful for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods. We're all out of the ordinary especially those of us who collect celebrity toes. So first and last ad then, yeah? Yeah, probably. For rebelling against heaven, Lucifer, I cast you down to hell. Oh, no! I'm going to burn in fire forever! What a terrible punishment! Oh, no, no you, you, you won't, no. Sorry, sorry, what now? Yeah, no, you're not going to burn. You're mostly going to... And trick humans, and then you burn them. Oh, okay, but but I but I won't be able to because I no longer have my angelic powers. So I'll spend eternity wishing no, I could no, take my. You're, you're still gonna have your powers. Really? I'm I'm keeping my powers. Oh yeah. Well, no. In fact, actually, you get a whole bunch of new demon powers, right? Uh, possession, uh, flies. Yeah, moving stuff around. <sighs> so I will have more powers than when I was an angel. Oh, yeah. No, angels are just going to mostly sit up here and, you know, watch you do your thing. Because you'd think they'd, like, intervene more, right? Like, there'd be, like, blessed houses where good things happen to no, people. No, you would think that. But no. no just, uh, uh, just the bad stuff. Ah. Huh. Okay. Well, look, hey, at least you're still in control of Earth, right? So I'm going to have no, to scrap for everything. No, actually, only at the, at the very end, I'll be... In, otherwise, it's going to be all you, my guy. Okay. Well, then, thank you. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, I guess. Thanks. See ya. See, yeah, see you. Teach him to rebel. <laughs> <laughs> And we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action with that birthday party that we've all been looking forward to. This is one of the two scenes with Omar Epps in it. He's there to sing for Glenn Close. Yeah. And I have to point out that this was such a wild tone shift scene to scene. Mm -hmm. Like, I know we took a little break in the middle of it, but I do have to point out that, like, they go from this tense moment of, like, child services leaving the house to... Happy birthday! Yep. <laughs> to yeah. to you. Oh, it's also it's doing that annoying thing where some of the people singing ha "Happy Birthday" see that as their moment to shine, so they're yep. all doing their own little kind of uh, like harmonizing here or riffs. Yeah, the fucking yeah, riffing on it. Yeah, it's terrible. Also, it's one of those like kids' birthday parties that happens 
seemingly at night in the pitch black because this is like the dead of night that this seemed to be happening. And it's on a weekday, right? Because like immediately after they sing happy birthday, she starts sending the kids to bed, telling them they got school tomorrow. It's like, it's Shantae's fucking birthday party. <laughs> yeah. But you've just blown the candles out. She hasn't even had the cake and now she's off to bed. Yeah. Also, well, this ca- there's a character who appears in this scene that never appears in the rest of the movie. Does she intimate that she jerks people off for a living? I So that's what I got from it. <laughs> so let me say something that I'm very uncomfortable saying. They're playing craps at this child's birthday party. Yes. Well, they're playing dice. Anyway. And when she wins, right, the older brother, Nate, is like, hey, how do you keep winning? And she makes the jerk off gesture and she's like, honey, don't you know what I do for a living? And says something about her, her hands. It makes her hands slippery or something. Yeah. Does that make you better at craps jerking people? <laughs> I don't know because am I amazing at craps? <laughs> <laughs> no, because like later she says to the mom that when she's leaving, she says, I've got a job to get to, which is sex that opens at 9 a.m. And I had to go back and put the subtitles on. And she says, sax, S-A-K-S. Like sax, yeah, yes, sax yes. Family, uh-huh. yeah. Well, I don't know what is that. What is that? And how does that, she jerks people off at sax? It's like Woolworths. Oh, okay. I I, I yeah. had no idea what sax was. But I was like, yeah. I, oh, the only thing I could be comfortable with is that it, it wasn't sex or at least wasn't called <laughs> sex. That's all I had. Yeah. Yeah, so she apparently jerks people off at a at a department store for a living and that makes her good at craps. I don't <laughs> I don't know. I was gonna leave it out, Eli, because it was so inexplicable that I didn't want to broach it. But yeah. And it never matters nope. to the movie. No, we don't yeah. see that person again at any point. It's never again. Uh, look, I've never said yes to those ladies with the perfume. Maybe they jerk you <laughs> off. Like, this, this is, I gotta look around my local sex and see if yes, there's a uh, getting no jerked shit. off section. <laughs> Maybe if Kamala wasn't afraid to let business and free enterprise Stop take root. Am name. I right? It's pronounced. Am I right, everybody? <laughs> but so also there's a moment here where like Omar Epps and Glenn Closer in the kitchen having the the casting director knows that you're not black right conversation again. <laughs> it's so funny. They've done this twice in the movie. <laughs> yep. Is she your just daughter, daughter? The or white your... writer might as well just wander into frame. Blah. <laughs> Family. <laughs> Although what I, what I will say is like, you know, Omar Epps is desperately trying to fuck Glenn Close and he doesn't care which of the tweens near him know about this at any point in the uh-uh. birthday uh-uh. party. But fair play to the movie that it's got a 26 year age gap, but it's the guy who is 26 year younger. At least yeah. that is yeah. that is fairly progressive. Fuck yeah. Look, I get it. So we all saw a fatal attraction <laughs> and made some choices. <laughs> So, but then in the middle of their conversation, there's a pounding at the basement door and it's Dre and he looks all demon possessed. Yeah, he's been like slamming his head against the basement door. That's the implication, yeah. People seem very relaxed about that. They're like, oh, Dre, what are you doing? Come on. So he's got a welt on the front of his head where he's slamming his head in the door. Right, right. And again, this is the story that she told, you know, Mm. why would, why did he have that great big injury on his fucking forehead? Yeah. Yeah. And again, to be clear, she's like, why are you doing that? And he's like, oh, Trey in the basement told me to. And she's like, I have no follow-up questions. You're in trouble. Go back to bed. Yep. Her friend basically responds like, your son's an idiot. Is the is the, is the amount of concern that we have here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The professional jerk-off person that works at Saks is like, your kids always banging their head against the door and talking about <laughs> demons named Trey. Not going to get a jerk-off internship if you're doing that kind of <laughs> stuff. I just want you to know. <laughs> So, but then the kids all go to bed. Mom drinks too much. And we have the whole like, you know, she she wants to party, but everybody else is like, I've got a job at sex to go to tomorrow. Yeah. You know? And it's like, now is her chance to get vodka wasted and grind on guys at your child's birthday party when <laughs> yeah. they've gone to bed. And there's always nobody there. Really wanted it to cut over to like two tweens being like, your mom and my dad seem to be getting <laughs> along. <laughs> I wish a demon would come along and rescue us from this situation. Yeah, right. Uh, But then Andre's standing around in the house after everybody leaves looking creepy and stuff. So she yells at him for being mentally ill while she's trying to party more. And that's that scene. Okay. That's that scene. So then it's that night. She's in bed when the demon starts banging on the door some more. So... So she responds by running into her kid's room with a baseball bat. Right. Yeah. 
This is three out of three nights in a row she has burst out of her room ready to fight a noise in her house. Yep, with yep. a baseball bat, yeah. And it's so weird because she's like, she's running around doing this and, it, and we, we were meant to think that this is like, oh God, the house is all abandoned. But it's not abandoned because we see Omar Epps is leaving, like having just left the house now in the middle of the night. So we're supposed to have assumed that they've just, he's just been fucking Glenn Close this entire time throughout the end of the, uh, enough for Ebony to go to sleep and wake up again. Yes, right, right. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that's clearly what the banging was, right? That was, <laughs> it is, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so Glenn Close sends Omar away and then she hears the kids yelling upstairs. They're like, Grandma, come help us. So she runs in and they have this very long moment where like, very clearly, Ebony is supposed to have hit the kids in some way, but it the movie's trying to offer up a bunch of suspense about that or what did or did not happen. Yeah, and this this is not suspenseful. Yeah, again, it's abuse apologetics as horror movie. Right. Yeah, and it, it's not suspenseful at all because none of the characters are saying that they know what happened. They're all like, oh, I don't know what's happened. But neither do we. We didn't see it. Right. So it's like that Hitchcock thing about suspense being where there's a conversation with characters at a table and there's a bomb under the table and the characters don't know that the bomb's there. But in this situation, neither do we. Right. <laughs> right. We're just watching Nobody people at lunch. all is aware yeah. of the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> right. So like we spent a very long time with Glenn Close going, so uh, Nate, what happened? And he's like, I don't know. And Shante, what happened? I don't know. And Andre, what happened? I don't know. We get that for a while. But the Batman mural is all smashed up and the kids are all beat up is what we do know, right? Right. Hmm. So trust us, something interesting happened, but we don't know what it was. So next day, Granny's driving them somewhere because she's decided they're not safe around the, the mom. And mystery lady that was sitting in her car staring at them when they were arguing with the Child Protective Services lady. Sorry, I'm doing a very bad job of (laughs) keeping you up with these characters. This character, her name is Apostle Bernice. She is following them as Granny's driving them away. Yes, and this is a sinister moment. But the sinister thing here is just a black person driving? Like, who wrote this film? A white cop? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So now we've got to have the moment where the kids the kids are all in school and they all start acting demon crazy at the same time. Right. But again, there's nothing supernatural about it. They're just abused children acting out in school. Like, yes. even here in the movie about their behavior... This is the behavior of traumatized, abused children. Yes. It absolutely is, yes. Yeah, so Nate is learning about the racism of our national response to AIDS, and he starts laughing very inappropriately. He got the giggles in school? So wait, the demon was going down his list. He was like, all right, let's see. uh, (laughs) This guy's going to float in the air. That guy over there, he's going to pass through walls, and I'll I'll say a bunch of stuff about dead relatives, and... uh, Let's just give Nate the giggles. What do you yes. say? Huh? <laughs> uh, as long as it's at a super inappropriate time. Yeah, yeah. inappropriate yeah. part of the history. Like inappropriate yeah, inappropriate giggles. Yeah, we don't want it to yeah. be. Yeah, obviously. An inconvenience, yeah. Shante's demonic thing is uh, menstruating all over the place, apparently. Having a period. Yep. <laughs> and Andre t- takes his shit in the middle of his classroom and throws it at the teacher and then eats some. Yeah. Is what he does. Mm-hmm. The de- the, I feel like Nate got it uh, off easy here. As oh, well, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Also, that didn't happen in the real story, at least according to the Wikipedia. So weird to make that up, seeing as Andre is now 21 years old. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Andre's going to see it with his family. He's just constantly turning to everyone in the theater. That's made up. They did that for the movie, everyone. Um, I, I didn't. We don't see, we see him like shit and then throw it at his teacher. Later, we found out that he ate it. So we didn't see that. So they didn't even need to like force us to hear that he ate it. They didn't have to include that detail at all, given that it wasn't made, it wasn't true and we didn't see it happen. Right. Well, my guess is that the writer assumed that we were going to see that awesome pet part where the kid ate his poop and then the the the, the, the MPAA was like, no, you're not going right. to okay. see not yeah, going to happen. Enough. Yeah. So yeah, so then we get we cut to Ebony at work getting a very awkward call from the school. Yeah, and this is this is a phone call from an unknown caller, which is so far the scariest thing in this movie. <laughs> so, so okay, so she goes to the hospital and like all we see all the kids getting 
various medical examinations. And this is where we get my best worst, right? The doctor turns to her and she's like, well, you know, we ran all the tests. Your kids are fine. They have no psychological issues whatsoever. If there's a problem, it can only be supernatural, right? Because they have to have this. They have to have this moment where science can't explain it. But like science can't explain it. The children are terribly abused and they're acting out in a, in a, in a, in a way that's very predictable when you suffer that level of abuse, right? But the movie can't just point that out because it kind of ruins the fucking movie. Right. Yeah, exactly. This scientific explanation is that like one of the kids got the giggles at an inappropriate time. The other kids who lives in poverty came on her period at a time that she wasn't expecting and wasn't prepared for. And her other kid and the and the third kid threw his shit around, which is bad, but like Having a shit is not supernatural. Throwing it is weird, but also not supernatural. Nope. You don't need to be ghost infused to throw shit. <laughs> yeah. so oh, sure. Now you say a shit's not supernatural. <laughs> but during Matreon, you're all bar the doors and where's the holy water? I'm just saying <laughs> one side of your mouth and the other. So, yeah. So, but science tells her this seems like a very ordinary poop throwing to me. And just then I had to pause the fucking movie because Lucinda walked in to bring my lunch to me. And what she's staring at is Glenn Close with her fucking Donald Trump bronzer with 37 crosses in each earring with a <laughs> subtitle that reads, and I quote, doctor, my son ate his own shit today. Mm, yeah. So that was that was a fun one to explain. Uh -huh. And I love that the doctors send them home from this as well. I'm 99% sure that if your son spontaneously ate his own shit in the middle of a lesson, the doctors wouldn't take a wait and see kind of approach. <laughs> <laughs> also, like she gets incredibly confrontational with this doctor and the doctor's like, oh, oh, you, you want to have like a serious talk about your kid's health? Should we talk about their bruises? And she's like, Pass. No. Change of scene. Just Literally goes, change of scene yes, right now. scene yeah. is over. <laughs> and again, I truly do not know who the movie wanted me to sympathize with that moment. I know who I sympathize with. Yeah. Well, okay, so then they're leaving the hospital and then Glenn Close has to like have it out with Ebony for being too violent with her kids, which plays out approximately like this. She says, Ebony, you're too violent. And Ebony says, I ought to kick your ass for saying that. Yes. <laughs> this conversation ends with, and I apologize because it's wildly offensive, but it's, you're just like all the other white people reporting on child abuse. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yep. So is that a thing other minorities dislike us for? Because I'm actually willing to own that well, one. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of reasons to dislike white people. That's not one of the <laughs> That's ones. That's not a good one. Yeah. So, okay. So that night, Ebony's shampoo and Dre's hair. When the phone rings, Glenn Close can't get the can't answer because she's busy hanging up a demon ward crucifix. This just ridiculously oversized crucifix that she's hanging up. Oh god, up. it's so yeah, funny. it's ludicrous. So Ebony has to run and get the phone. It's the hospital telling her she owes thirty thousand dollars for all the shit throwing exams that that her kids just got. Which means she'll have to do a few more haircuts at this best played salon of all time, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. No kidding. But as she's like harumphing her way away, Glenn Close stops her and says, hey, the Lord doesn't give you more than you can handle. Mm, yeah, says the lady with cancer whose medical treatments are driving her daughter into poverty right yes. now. That is the plot yeah. so far. Yeah. Yep. Also, Really seems like the Lord is giving her more than she can handle. <laughs> she like, sure fucking like, does, yeah. She's certainly not handling it well. <laughs> well, and and so and she says, and I quote, "Enough with the Jesus bullshit for one night." And I like, I, look, I hate to side with abusive mom, but that is the correct answer in this moment, right? It is, right. but I think yeah. it's only like the second time she's mentioned Jesus in the entire film because she's not that religious at any point until now. Like the mom seems to. We saw her; she was at church right. in like the first scene and that's the last time she did anything Jesus-y until now. Yeah, true. So Abedi goes to try to take down the cross because, you know, it's her fucking house but Granny Glenn ain't having none of that shit. Oh, it's great. Ebony says to her, this is a fix, ma. And it's like, no, it's it's a crucifix. You all know <laughs> that. It's not <laughs> so close. Maybe that's what they call it, the kids? Is that slang? The fix, <laughs> yeah. Here's my fix. So, but Ebony, Ebony goes back up to the bathroom to finish shampooing Dre's hair and she finds Nate drowning Dre in the bathtub because he's demon possessed. Again, another thing that didn't happen in the real story. I just, mm. I'm picturing this family standing. Okay, hi everyone. I did not 
try to drown my brother, my mom. <laughs> really, really carried away my mom's lies here. I say, you know, it's weird to be like, oh, don't tell lies about my mom's lies, but I did not try to murder my brother. <laughs> the drowning scene goes on for way too long as well because the entire time Andre isn't drowning. So I just thought, right. God, this kid can really hold his breath. Yeah, like, that's very impressive. If he survives this whole thing, he should go into like swimming of some sort. Yeah, or, fucking, yeah. This, he's got a- athlete in him. Kate Winslet's got nothing on him. Do you know that kid's full name is actually David Blaine? I, oh, there's the, woof, man. It's just, we really need <laughs> Heath back <laughs> now. David Blaine's great. So, okay. But <laughs> if I don't scream that my jokes are good after I do them, <laughs> some people, people won't, people won't know. know. So, yeah, but but again, so yes, this this fucking movie yet again is just actors playing out increasingly unlikely excuses this lady made for her kids' bruises. Yeah. Speaking of which, the next scene is Cynthia showing up to check on the kids again, and of course, the movie's supposed to play it out like, oh, child protective services always showing up at the most inconvenient times when a, a demon innocently abused your kids while you weren't looking. Yeah, we're supposed to sympathize with, I'd prefer if you look in on my children's welfare a different time. Yeah. Yeah, she, she tries to do the no thank you on the door set. She, <laughs> she totally does. does. <laughs> like, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. I do not consent to, uh, that's nothing. Nothing you're saying. But is anything. This isn't a random inspection. Your kids were literally just in the hospital being investigated for all sorts of signs of trauma and abuse. This right. is a very well scheduled appointment. Yes, exactly. And so if Cynthia finally pushes her way in the door and Ebony's like, okay, it's the house's fault. The house has been beating my kids up. Yeah. And she says, I keep hearing things. But like Ebony says that, oh, I've, I've been hearing things. But no, no, she isn't. Or if she is, she hasn't mentioned that to us at any point in this movie. And we Why haven't seen tell us. Right. She, she says at this point, she's like, you know, the other night, Andre was speaking a foreign language and said that a ghost told him to kill himself. And I'm like, well, that sounds like a scene that you should have included in your fucking horror movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He said, oh, he, uh, Andre said this little boy told him he should kill himself. No, he didn't. He absolutely We've did not. We've been here the whole time. I rewound it to see if I could find it. Yeah. <laughs> Ghost meant to kill Andre. He could kill himself. He is um, in, like, going through a lot right now. It's busy. So, but then Cynthia tells us her tragic backstory about her dead son. No relevance to the larger film at all. Mm-mm. Yeah. Right. I guess she just felt like she should get a dramatic monologue too. And once she wraps that up, Glenn Close comes downstairs with a baseball bat to threaten this woman for trying to protect her grandchildren from their abusive mother. Yeah. And again, I think the movie wants us to think that's good. Yes, that Glenn Close is standing up for her kid. By threatening child protective services with a baseball bat. And then they say like, oh, they're gonna, the, 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 when child protective services leave, Glenn Close and Ebony are talking. They're saying, oh, they're going to take our babies. It's like, well, now you've threatened violence on CPS, they will, like 100%. Right. <laughs> yeah, you didn't make it better. The next step is the police. Right. Also, they should take away your babies. <laughs> Please do. Yes. So then we get a scene where Glenn Close is going to her minister to try to justify the film's inclusion in our show a little bit. Don't worry, she will. I want to point out that this is one of the only real moments in the movie. So grandma did go to her local church and was like, hey, my kids are full of demons. That's why they're missing so much school. And the pastor was like, no, I'm not that brand of liar. <laughs> right. So they had to go with a different one. Yeah, no, they're like, you're not, you're not Catholic. What the fuck are you talking about? This doesn't, <laughs> we don't even have this. So, okay, so meanwhile, Ebony is at the bar being an alcoholic, and as she leaves the bar, fucking Apostle Bernice, the character that has just been, like, sitting in a car across the way, staring ominously at them here and there, she finally confronts Ebony and says, it's time for me to make sense. It's time for this to be a horror movie. Yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, yes! We're, we are more than an hour in. We need to get to do some actual <laughs> exercising here. We really blew our wad on you hitting your kids for the first half of this yeah. film. Yeah, and we find out that this lady who's been following this, Bernice, is like a door-to-door exorcist. Like the littlest yes. hobo, but for demons. <laughs> <laughs> She is, though, because she Ebony goes to walk away and, and Bernice says, your kids aren't 
sick. There's an evil spirit in your house. And she's like, oh, that is a great excuse. I could probably get a movie deal with that. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds great way for me not to have my kids taken away. Yeah. And she explains why she didn't get involved sooner. She said, I just needed to confirm my suspicion before I intervened. But like that confirmation of suspicion apparently included letting a kid almost drown. Yep. Like if if Andre had drowned, she'd be like, "Yeah, it's demons. That I've was got yeah, it now. We can do something." Okay, I'm gonna do one for three. One for three. <laughs> the shit throwing probably should have been enough for me. Yeah, but yeah, she's they go to McDonald's together, and she goes, <laughs> "So funny." That weird plug. Do you think that was a fit? Because this is on Netflix. Yep. So someone had to call Netflix. I assume they do a bunch at once. And they were like, okay, so here's all the McDonald's we have in the movies. Uh, oh, we're doing a horror movie, uh, Deliverance. She's going to tell about another family dying over a McFlurry. Do you want the McFlurry <laughs> turned <laughs> to the can? No, just the cop. Okay, just the cop. I really right wanted there. it to be like an overly thick milkshake. And she kept like interjecting the story with like a... <laughs> <laughs> just, just struggling to get it up the straw. Yeah, you got to right, sort of like right. smoosh it around a bit, let it warm up a bit, and then it'll it'll be fine. No wonder the ice cream machine's always broken. It's got to make it through the cement. Am I right? <laughs> oh, we have fun. So yeah, so she goes. They're sitting there having their McDonald's. She goes, "I'm an apostle," and it's like, "What was the conversation while you were getting your food? You guys were in line together." <laughs> 12 piece. I want a 12 piece. She goes, I'm an apostle. And I'm like, what a great time to stop taking a person seriously. And as I'm writing this, she goes, a prophet, an evangelist. I'm like, as though to emphasize my point. <laughs> an avenger. <laughs> So she's like, a, a family died in that house of yours before. I have a picture of them. She's like, weird thing for you to have a picture of. And so now she's going to tell us the story of the family-wide axe murder that happened there before. Yeah, and this actor, the one who plays the mom who axe murders her whole family, that's Dominic Tony, Dominique Tony, who I went to school with nice. at okay. NYU. I texted her when she came up and I was like, hey, we're reviewing the movie you were in. And she was like, oh, I'll listen to the review. And I was like, don't. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. We shouldn't do she that. Good, you were she wields good. an axe well. I've got to say that. Oh, that yeah. Great no, yes, work. yeah. No, she Absolutely. nailed it. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. So, and, and then they, okay, there's this great moment where they justify the title of the movie, right? Because she goes, are you telling me my son needs an exorcism? She's like, no, nope, that is trademarked. Uh, he, he needs, and, and they go in, she explains that it's a deliverance that he needs. And there's like some weird, stupid theological minutia that they explain as though we give a shit to differentiate between an exorcism and a deliverance. Yeah. Yes, it, nothing like a horror movie to take the same side about demonology as Greg Locke's documentary. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, specifically, she says, I don't do no exorcisms. I don't need no intercessor. Jesus Christ is my intercessor. It's like, okay, but sounds like you do need an intercessor. You do, right? it's like, Jesus you, you just Christ. Named your intercessor. Like, you, yeah. <laughs> you have one, yeah. She also says, if you act in the authority of Jesus Christ, you can touch your body. And I wrote, spoken like a true member of the clergy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And and while she's telling this story and explaining the difference between an exorcism and deliverance, we cut to like Glenn Close smelling some stinking death in the basement and going to check it out. Oh, yeah. Does this smell come and go or is it there the whole time? And like they don't they just get used to it like a smell like, oh, you know, they go out they come back oh god yeah the death smell I keep forgetting about that yeah right yeah, so I, I, adjust it over time. <laughs> I'm nose blind you see. Yeah. <laughs> So, but Glenn Close picks up a Bible defensively and then gets beaten to death by a demonic tween. Which again, did not happen. <laughs> what a huge plot point to include in your base on a true story that Dre, while under the influence of a demon, killed his grandmother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's standing yeah. up in the theater going, all right, guys, this is worse, I guess, than the, if you only don't believe one thing, believe the poop <laughs> thing and not this thing. <laughs> And when she is being attacked, Glenn Close does have the expression of a respected actor who just got to this bit of the script. So that, that, that's <laughs> yeah. even acting, that expression on her face. And the devil speaks in Dre's voice here. My question is, and it's a brave one, is that problematic? What race is the devil? Oh, interesting. 
I mean, he's supposed to, I mean, at least in Utah, he's white and delightsome, right? Oh, so I feel like he got back down to hell and they were like, oh, so you did a little A-A-V-E. Uh, he's like, yeah, did you like that? I talked like they talk. And it was like, eh, maybe, maybe skip it next time. So that's <laughs> tricky because like on the I one hand, possession, like possession of the demon is that person, but it is, they're also like, it's, it's got to be appropriation because you are appropriating their body. So I think right. it's problematic. I think it would come down to this other problem. But then is it even more problematic if he's like, it is a... Balthazar. It's like, that's not how Trey talks. And it's like, well, I, I think we all express ourselves in different ways. <laughs> Either that or it'd be more problematic if the demon only went for white people so to avoid having to change their reverse, vernacular. And it's like, ah. Uh, reverse racism, Satan. Yeah, Just, exactly. It's like, it's the whole thing admire. of like, you know, can, can uh, actors from one culture play actors from different culture or is that problematic? <laughs> it's the same with demons. It very right. much is. It's like, oh, yeah. well, th this demon is Korean. Should it really be like inhabiting a Japanese person or is that <laughs> uh, a problem? <laughs> Why does Satan have a Martin Luther King quote on his Facebook. This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but but then of course this is where we learn that the kid who died that was demon possessed from the other family, his name was Trey, the same name as the ghost that Dre has been hanging out with. Don't have them called Dre and Trey because that is too I, right. confusing. It's yeah. so dumb. Yeah, and 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 this and Shante, the sister, they go, she goes by Tay. So there's a Dre, a Trey, and a Tay in this fucking movie, and there didn't need to be. So, but Ebony storms off. She's like, no, it's not act three yet. And Apostle Lady is like, take my number. It'll be act three in just a second. So I, I guess that's basically the movie grabbing us by the ears, making hard eye contact and saying it is to a Christian horror movie, which gives us <laughs> an opportunity for a break. But first, let me give act three the hard sell. Will the kids get the psychological help they so desperately need? Will they be permanently removed from Ebony's custody? Will Apostle Lady even successfully exercise their demons? No. No on all fucking three, but keep watching anyway for the more damning than damned conclusion of The Deliverance. Now, remember, do not let the demon get into your head. He will know things he shouldn't know, but you cannot give in to him. You, you got it, Father. Daddy? Daddy, help me. Daddy is here, son. Well, look who it is, Padre. Vile spirit, you will leave this place. By the power of Christ! Oh, no, don't banish me, because then I'd have to go back to torturing Margaret. Do you know a Margaret? I uh, no. Yeah, sweet Margaret. Sorry, did you say no? You said no? Yeah. No, sorry. I don't. Rick Wilson? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, two 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 Redwood Drive. No. No, I live I live in Fleetwood. What Redwood Drive? Oh fuck. The Lord is my shepherd. I okay, shall can, not just, can you give me a second? Can you I'm obviously in the middle of something. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Wait, did did you look up the wrong person? No, I'm a demon, and I have demon knowledge that's gonna Scorch your soul? Oh, you're going to... Oh, go ahead. Scorch my soul then. I know that you jerk off to porn. Well, dude, everybody jerks off to porn. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Uh, okay. But if I wasn't... If I hadn't looked you up, how would I know that the porn you like is... Big titties? Seriously. Lesbian stuff. Yeah. I meant lesbian okay, stuff. You're, you're obviously just making shit up. Do you want to... Do you want to like leave and come back? Or, no, because uh, then I'm exercised. That's the whole point. That's kind of the whole point, yeah. Yeah. Look, I committed... Okay, let me level with you guys. I committed to a skull in the woods like 40 years ago, and it, nobody has been there. And then this week, they just started work there. There's like a whole logging crew, and I, I'm just... I'm stretched right now. Oh, I, I'm, I'm I, having I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Am I throwing off your work-life balance? I'm just You're saying, give me like 45 minutes to get on ChatGPT, and I'm going to do such a good roast for you. I really... Wow. No, no. I, I think we'll just leave, actually. Yeah. This is seriously weak. No, just don't... Weak. You're probably worried about the election, huh? Those polls are looking tight. They're gone. Can I have my body back? Give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin the action with Ebony getting home to find the smoke detector wailing because the crucifix is on fire. 
And Glenn yeah. Close is dead also on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she is. Yeah, she's opted out of the rest of the film. Yeah. This section of the movie is like, you know when the scenes that happen in teen movies where like, there's been a party and the parents are on the way home. That's what the demon is doing with the horror movie. He's like, <laughs> oh God, um, and the cross is on fire and I killed Glenn Close and uh, I spoiled all the milk in the fridge. Oh man. <laughs> Andre comes down all demonic and slow and he goes, what happened to grandma? And and Ebony's like, oh, come on. We know you killed her. Obviously, you killed her. We saw that scene. There's a moment that's meant to be high drama where Ebony sees Glenn Close dead and she yells like, Andre! But she yells it like Kirk yelling Khan and it just seems ridiculous. <laughs> I can't get past it. And then Shante yells for mom. She's upstairs and she's like, mom. And I'm like, whatever she's got going on isn't as important as the dead lady downstairs and the active fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she runs upstairs and then we get like, you know, later we get like Cynthia ominously taking pictures of this crime scene because apparently they just fled the scene of the crime. Yeah. She's walking around the house like she's a forensic investigator. She's CPS. That's what I was going to yeah. say. Right. I don't think they let Child Protective Services just come in and snap a few PS. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so then we cut to mom driving them to elsewhere, right? Uh, kidnapping. kidnapping. Yeah, well, exactly. What she's so doing. As, yeah. as much as I yell at haunted house movie characters to do this, just to leave the fucking house, in this instance, it's like you're fleeing the scene of the crime, though, is what it, is what you're doing now. And Shante is like, well, mom, I, I'm the one that called Cynthia because, because you know, people were dead in our home and, and yeah. it was on fire. I'm <laughs> a child and I needed protection. Yes. <laughs> and there's a service for <laughs> that. Service so. for that. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, Ebony gives this absolutely batshit insane, it's hard being a mom monologue to which even the demon is like, I'm sorry. Was that supposed to like bring me to your side? As you she, are the worst. Yeah, yes. she says. She says you think it's easy doing what I do, but what you do is endangering your children. You like, drink yes. and hit your kids. It seems pretty easy. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, but then Andre like demons at her a little bit from the back seat, and she looks in the rearview mirror, and his eyes turn all black. So she pulls the car over and runs away like the fucking lawyer in Jurassic Park just leaves her kids behind with a demon in the car. To run into a bar. She runs into a bar. The alcoholic, abusive mother leaves her kids in the car having fled the scene of a crime and runs into a bar and is meant to be the sympathetic character here. Oh, yeah. Now, to be clear, this is from the real story. The mom did run in psychosis into a bar and had obviously been abusing her kids that she had kidnapped. So they've now rewritten this as, no, it was Andre's demon. Andre's yep. demon is carbon monoxide poisoning, apparently. Oh. So yeah, so she runs into this bar and she yells at all the people and says, hey, somebody come and kick my demon son's ass for me. And a bunch of people are like, yeah, no, I can do that. Oh, I fuck yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Weird number of people take her up on that. But then they get, they check the kids and the kids are just like clearly abused. So now she's in like a jail or something. Right. And there's a social worker giving her like, they go through this intake form with her. But it's weird because the intake form, it's a lot about like what's been happening with the kids and stuff, but none of the authorities seem that interested in the dead mum and the burning house. That doesn't nope. seem to be a thing that anybody cares about. No, it didn't come up. There's a lot of like, is your house haunted questions in there, yeah. right? There's a lot of weird, like, has there been weird banging and flies, you know? Right. Well, because the movie wants us to be like, because again, this woman was actually forcibly committed, right, for a short amount of time because she was having a psychotic episode in public, right? And so what this movie is trying to rewrite that as is, look, if you have a demon in your house, a lot of those questions make it seem like you have psychosis. But right. actually, yes, <laughs> you were hearing noises and strange voices. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So, but then we get uh, Cynthia showing up to assure her that, hey, you know, like they're taking your kids away, but there's still a lot of movie to go for you at this point. Yeah, she says, it's not forever. And I wrote in my notes, I hope it's forever. I am rooting for forever. Well, I, I yeah. was rooting for forever. And then she says, they're going into church foster care. And I'm like, oh, well, uh, maybe. Uh, lateral? Is that, yeah, not, is that a lateral move? <laughs> better? Yeah, I, I had two lines of dialogue back to back was it's the best thing I wrote it literally is and then it says they're sending them to a church foster care I was like, okay so it's not the best thing it's not the best <laughs> yeah. Thing. Yeah, yeah. it's the best it is a thing <laughs> probably better but not necessarily yeah 
So then we get this scene where Ebony's going to a church, and I thought that that was like her getting her life together, right? It was going to be that scene or whatever. But no, she's going to see Apostle Bernice because she's like, yeah, no, I, it's it's definitely not that I'm psychotic. It's that there's a demon in my kid. I need an excuse, sir. There, take my kid. There's such a weird thing here as well. I have no idea why, but they shoot this this church with a fisheye lens. If you look to the side, all of the the walls have like a curvature to them because the lens is fisheye. So I don't know if they're trying to make this room look bigger than it actually is. It's such a weird choice. Right. I, 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 I was so distracted by it. So she starts talking to. Bernice, and th there's a weird moment where she like wants to know the demon's backstory. <laughs> yeah. Right? She says, this demon's got my son. She's like, where's it from? And I'm like, well, it's obviously from fucking hell. It's a demon. You know, it's from it's from New Jersey. Jesus Christ. I'm from Bayonne originally. <laughs> you know, thank you. Nobody ever asks. Yeah, that, no, but where, where are you really from, demon? <laughs> where are you really from? Oh, wow. That's I hate so that. racist. Wow. wow. <laughs> All right. Why don't you go march with Tommy Robinson? <laughs> <laughs> Go beat up some of Marsha's neighbors. <laughs> but this is where Bernice explains that all three of the kids are possessed by the one demon, which is uh, like a three for one deal when it comes to exorcisms, actually. You're getting it pretty <laughs> cheap. But in order for her to fight back, in order for Ebony to get her kids back from the demon, she has to be sufficiently Christian. Right. Not a good person. She's not like, you know, well, you have to not be abusive. You have to not be an alcoholic. No, you just have to be the correct religion a lot. Right. You got to be all the way Christian if you want to fight this demon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We also get some of her backstories to why she isn't Christian, why she doesn't believe in anything. And it is just, again, it's like she was, it was a traumatic story, a traumatic event in childhood. And she asked God for help and God didn't do anything. And that's the reason she's atheist because she's angry with God. Yeah. Christian movie tick. Yeah. And she, she tells this to a possible lady. She's like, yeah, no, my mom let someone sexually assault me as a child. And she's like, you should not tell that story. She well, she immediately goes to and you should ask his forgiveness now for letting yes. that happen to you. Like, what? You should what now though? And it's so weird when we see the flashback of her like of, of, of someone coming down the stairs to do that. It is exactly the same set of stairs that are in her own basement. And you you'd think she'd avoid a house with a spooky trauma basement when you go house hunting at that point. If right. you do have like spooky Honestly. spooky trauma house stuff going on in basements, just don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah, so she tells the her tragic backstory and then prays, you know, asks God to forgive her for all of the trauma she went through. And then we cut to Cynthia, the child protective services lady, checking on Andre. So he's in the hospital now because he's, you know, full on demon possessed. Yeah. Hmm. So they, they've got him like strapped down. She starts talking to him and he goes like, my mother is dead. God is dead. And everybody's like, yeah, so it's probably like... Uh, we're thinking uh, maybe bulimia. I, I don't know. Just, <laughs> uh, I just wanted him to carry on listing dead people. Like, Einstein's dead. The guy who hosted Supermarket Sweep is dead. <laughs> it's, honestly, it's like when I call home to speak to my mum, basically. I was gonna list. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Guess who's dead? God. You do. <laughs> yes, you, you, you do. You met him back in the He used to live in the church at the end of our street. <laughs> you see him All on right. a Sunday. No, no, you he do. He was at your first communion. Yeah, his yeah. son used to do those magic tricks till he had that <laughs> falling out with Mrs. Iscariot's son. <laughs> Speaking of Mrs. Iscariot's son, you'll never guess what happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where uh, the kid walks backwards up the wall. Now, the actual story made a huge deal about this because the doctor saw it. And if I, if I may borrow from Wikipedia here, <laughs> the walking up the wall backwards incident failed to mention that the boy's grandmother was, in fact, holding his hand throughout, which allowed the boy to push himself against the wall and walk up it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because that means, unlike what we see in the movie where he fucking spider climbs up the wall, at some point in the hospital, Grandma was like, Do you want to walk on the wall a little bit? And he was like, That would be fun, Grandma. It's <laughs> like, yes. yeah. Okay. Uppies. We're describing uppies as demonic possession now. Yeah. So th this is where the movie takes its all the fucking way turn, right? Because up until this point, the movie's been kind of like the exorcism of Emily Rose was like, Was it a demon or was it a mental illness? Well, mental illnesses mm. exist, so we know the fucking answer. But up until this point, the movie had kind of done this. At this point, the kid squirts out of his restraints, right? He's strapped down, 
and then walks backwards up the wall like the third act of Inception, right? And then we're like, oh, so we are going with demons then. We could have just started off like that and the movie would have been an hour shorter and less boring. Yeah, this, this kid goes from naught to demon incredibly fast. Just like instant, bam, full demon. Right, here we go. This is what we were after the entire fucking film. Yes. Well, and, and uh, immediately after that, as though trying to deliver us a punchline, the very next scene after he walks backwards up the wall is Cynthia walking uh, down a hallway doing a walk and talk with the doctor and the doctor saying the words... Let's not hit the panic button just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Why even have that button then? Yeah, that's what the button's for. Yeah, like exactly. Like so, when when the kid starts climbing the wall, that's that's the end of the scene for us. She, did she just walk out of the room? Like, how did that scene clearly end yes. in reality? <laughs> okay, you know so, what? No, okay, you know what? If you're gonna walk up the walls, I'm gonna leave, Andre, and I'll come back <laughs> when you're ready to talk. When you're ready to walk on the floor like a grown up. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, and then also at this point, mom is sneaking into the hospital to kidnap Andre, who has just been taken away from her by the state. Yeah, as the hero, as the hero yep. here, she's doing that. Yep. Also, like she's she's disguised as a nurse. She's walking around saying hi to everybody. She's got like an ID badge hanging from her uh, uniform and stuff, but she's saying hi to everyone. And does it feel vaguely racist that she can walk around in scrubs saying hi to <laughs> people and that's enough to convince everyone that she's a nurse? Oh, there's, yeah, she's probably a nurse. It's fine. I'm sure she yep. works here. Well, it doesn't work on anybody, which is so funny because she's like, hello, co-worker. And they're like, I know who works here. no. <laughs> yeah, they actually like they, they have you like you can overhear all the people going, "Who the fuck was that? Why is she waving at us?" <laughs> you don't do that at places you were. I don't walk down the hallways places I were. Hello, I Hi. also work here like you. We know each other. <laughs> I mean, you guys work in your house. It would be weird if, like, no one just greeted Lucinda <laughs> like that. Hi, co-worker. Lucinda. <laughs> so, so yeah, but so she goes to kidnap the kid and. The doctor's going to go check on him because, of course, he's heard about the wall walking thing. And he goes, hey, take me to the room that Andre Jackson is in. And the nurse at this point goes, it's room 509. I'm not going back in there. And it's like, oh, well, then you would be, I would, I would think, fired then because mm -hmm. there's a yes. person there that needs your help and that's your job. But no, instead, we, we cut to uh, Apostle Bernice helping it, Ebony kidnap Andre. Right, they drive off and take him back to the house that even this movie says is trying to kill him. Yes, take the demon kid back to the place he got demoned. Is this yeah. plan here? Yeah, right. I guess you got to burn him in the mountain from where he was forged or whatever. And then so they get him back there. They strap him down. Apostle Bernice comes out with her very sticky noted Bible. <laughs> yeah. she, al she also has a tape recorder and she gets Ebony to consent to this uh, exorcism on tape. Just like ready, just primed for the manslaughter trial. Like, not yeah, yeah. really. In it yeah. All of the way. I've been through this before. My lawyer says I have to have you do this before I kill your kid with my stuff. Yes, yeah, uh-huh. And she's like, yeah, now remember, no matter what your son says or how much he cries out, don't help him. And and she, this is a great time to emphasize how often people die from this shit, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Worth pointing out here. But don't worry, she says spiritual warfare, so it sounds super badass. And then we get our goddamn exorcism scene. So it starts with her, like, sprinkling holy water on him and him screaming... And then he turns into Glenn Close. And we thought that Glenn Close had made it out, right? We thought, well, you know, <laughs> she still has a bit of her dignity intact, right? <laughs> no. So she hasn't said the words nappy pussy at any point yet. So probably, you know, you know she's, she's still like a, nominated eight times. She's never won one. There's at least still a possibility. But no, no, she comes back. Can I say something? Yeah. I think they should give it to her for this. <laughs> <laughs> And her clip is the I can smell your nappy pussy part. And she just, they announce her name. She's just shaking her head in her chair. Nope, don't want it. Don't, <laughs> don't want it. But like the dialogue in this is all terrible. Like th That is even that, I can smell your nappy pussy. That is boring shock dialogue. It's like an idiot's idea of what's offensive. It's like watching a Ricky Gervais stand-up, essentially. <laughs> True, yeah. <laughs> oh God, the, the devil's post this movie stand-up special. So a lot of you know that I called a woman with a nappy pussy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> people didn't like that. And the racists in the audience are like, woo! 
Dave Chappelle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Chappelle, everybody. Honestly, I feel like the Academy is watching this portion of the movie going like, see, that's why we never gave her one. They didn't understand at the time. They kept saying, oh, you should give one to Glenn Close. She's been nominated so many times. But this is what we knew she had this in her. We knew she'd do this eventually. She yep. had to. <laughs> yep. So, okay, so then, so we're getting the exorcism of Andre, but we also get like Nate and Shante waking up, feeling, because I guess the demon is in them too. So they're also having like denouements. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's three times as many exorcism films here. We've got, you've got the, the kid being exercised. You've got it three times. This is three times better than the exorcist. No, if you think about Just it. Just by maths alone. Yes. <laughs> So we get that. We get the house shaking from all the demonic power. Bernice sends Ebony away. She's like, you go upstairs for the rest of the movie. And she's like, that doesn't sound right. She's like, it's not. You'll be in the basement later with no explanation. Don't worry, yeah, <laughs> the entire house is shaking. And so for safety, she sends her upstairs in yeah, the shaking house. That's, that's, that is not safe. That's probably the right idea. Get under a desk. <laughs> <laughs> Dig a hole and put some planks over <laughs> right, it. Yeah. Yeah. So th there's a great moment here, too, where the kid disappears, and then we hear him running around like when Stewie goes all ninja, you know, just a pitter-patter, pitter-patter, yes! pitter-patter. <laughs> He's invisible demon boy. The only thing less interesting than the, a demon exorcism is an invisible demon yes! exorcism. We're exercising an invisible demon now. Yeah. I, I bet his head is spinning 360 degrees the entire time he's invisible. We, we wouldn't even fucking know. Yes, no. exactly. <laughs> so, and he kills her. Right. He's like, he invisibly drags her around by the hair a little bit, which is fucking hilarious looking. And then he like slams her into the ground and she dies. She does yeah. die. Yes. Yeah. Great work. Expert exorcist here. Keep in mind, this woman's advice has been, you need to have enough faith in Jesus if you want to defeat the demon. She's the source of Christian faith in this movie and she has just died. Yep. Well, but she doesn't die right off, right? She gets smashed and then she has time to give a monologue to Ebony about how her faith has to be stronger than that of the person that exercises demons for a living. No fear in this dojo. Right, well, but that's just the thing. She's like, my faith wasn't strong enough. I'm like, you're in the middle of fighting a demon. You don't even need faith anymore. Why would you have, like, what a, what a moment to have a crisis of fucking faith when there's a demon <laughs> lifting you up and blowing smoke out of somebody's ass and being invisible and shit. Like, that, to me, I'm an atheist. I would be all fucking convinced at that very point. Right, you would have to, much later, you you would have to show me a lot of, you know, CCTV to convince me. Yes, <laughs> 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 exactly, yeah. right. So, but she gives Ebony the, the holy water and she's like, you have to finish the deliverance. And she's like, oh God, I would have thought this movie would be fucking over by now. So she goes to the basement where obviously the demon lives. For the first time in this fucking film, this yes. is the first time anybody <laughs> has gone into the spooky basement where everything happens. Yes. <laughs> yes. So yeah, so she she goes down the, the stairs crack on the way down so that something is happening. <laughs> she doesn't turn on the light. She she just like carries a, a fucking flashlight. Now most movies would have the moment where she pulls the cord, but nothing happens. This dumbass movie doesn't even have that, right? Apparently she just didn't even think of it. And then so and Andre is is downstairs when she gets there, and he's like, "I'm not demon possessed. I'm just your son." And she's like, "Bullshit! I hit him anyway." And and so. <laughs> <laughs> she like holy water sprinkles at him he grabs her by the hair and drags her around because that looks even sillier when he's not invisible <laughs> apparently he joke slams her at one point like the undertaker style yes. joke slams <laughs> yes, her yes and it's just this little 10 year old boy yeah so silly but again like I was hearing the Rocky music at this point I was like yeah demon get her <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, and well, and then like the, now it's a mirror match. All of a sudden, she's beating herself oh, yeah. up. Yeah, but it's a mirror match. But she's wearing the same outfit. She doesn't even like change the colors up on the outfit. That's what they should have done. Well, right, she should have yes. pressed B when she was selecting herself as a well, character. Exactly. Then it been. <laughs> right. Duh. Yeah, and then the demon starts breaking her bones, and we're going like, "Oh, nice!" Because she probably broke some bones at some point. Like, oh, oh, and her legs too. But then she yells. Jesus! Ah, oh, incredible laugh out loud moment. Yeah. yeah. And you'd think at that moment she's calling on the power of Jesus and, the, and she's going to be fine. But no, the other her like choke slams her again and then stomps on her throat real good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I got distracted. I was up here. I'm having a mani pedi done. I, <laughs> yes. you, need, you need my focus right now. Okay. You know, I'm on here. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> 
But then she she remembers how much she loves her kids, and she, we flash back to the most banal parts of the movie. Yeah, we, we flash back to all the times she wasn't beating her kids, which is why right. it's so banal in the movie. There's very few little snippets to, to, to go on. <laughs> yeah, and she yells, you know, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. I can do all things th- through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm like, oh, she has all the cliches. At this point, I thought she was going to kill the demon by saying, live, laugh, love. love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so she does that. She speaks in tongues now. But even when it is scripted, she can't avoid doing the, the repeating of the same noises. So it's the idea that what the demon was missing to be defeated is <laughs> is so fucking funny. It is. It's amazing. <laughs> So yeah, so she shamalamalamas a lot with Jesus in there. The demon catches on fire. A pit to hell opens up. She uses her telekinesis to throw the demon into the pit. Demons have fire resistance. Everyone knows yeah, that. Obviously. It's unreal. It's so, <laughs> so fucking stupid. And then she like comes to and she's on the floor and she's like, oh, fuck, that demon was my kid. Did I just throw him in a hell pit? But no, he's... There's, He's there. There is a solid four minutes of this movie where you think she's going to be like, ah, fuck, I sent my kid to hell. <laughs> I, but she's like, should I? She's like yelling about it. She's yelling to try and find him. She's like looking around like, Andre, Andre. And then she turns and he's there on the floor. But the thing is, how did she not see him until we did? Right. She was in the room, the empty room with him. She'd have to wait for the camera to turn around because she was looking in that direction. It's just a basement. Yes. Yeah. It's <laughs> so. And also she goes to hug him and she lays down with him. But the whole to hell is still still there. I'm like, you put up some orange cones at first before you pass out, wouldn't you? Jesus fucking Christ. Cuts to a contractor the next day. This is not good. This is going to cost. This is not going to be cheap. And that's if I can get my guys. All right. That's if I can get my hellhole filling guys. Because I know a lava guy, but uh, it's uh, going to cost you. Eli, would you take a uh, hole to hell in your ba- in your basement over what's been happening in your basement? Oh, yeah, website? really, yeah, honestly. Are you kidding? The devil and I have so much in common and he'd be like I love your recordings man we all sort of gather near the hole getting in early on the ma- I'm a patron <laughs> <laughs> so okay so now it's morning and they do this part where they try to make Pittsburgh look beautiful and it's just sad it's just fucking sad <laughs> might as well be like a bird twittering on a crack dealer's shoulder <laughs> 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 so yeah so but Cynthia shows up and she like gives her a, a pep talk and she's like you'll get your kids back eventually probably because our system is deeply deeply flawed and broken does she say at one point I'll talk to the judge but those kids were fucked up <laughs> I don't I didn't hear rough. that it's exactly yeah. she does yeah she was like yeah your kids were pretty they're pretty up. fucked up they've been, they've been badly beaten by their abusive mother but I reckon we can try and persuade no, the judge with demons see Cynthia doesn't even mention the demon particularly, does she? I don't think it particularly addresses the fact that there were demons going on here. Nope. She sure as fuck doesn't. She goes at one point, she goes, well, you know, your kids don't remember any of this. And I'm like, oh, or it's a lie. Yeah. Right? <laughs> there would be the other explanation for why they wouldn't have any memory of it. She says, you know, she's like, well, you know, if it's God's will, I'll get my kids back. And Cynthia goes, wow, I sure am impressed by how Christian you are. And I'm like, Really? Really, that quickly? Because huh. you know all of the, you saw the bruises. of her kids that you did. Woof. But Ebony's like, I can help you be more Christian. And she gives her a little cross necklace. Okay. And that is bribery of a public official. So you're never going to see your kids again. <laughs> <laughs> and then the camera pans away from the neighborhood as though we're going to like eventually end on a pop scare for part two or something. But, but we don't. Yes, I wrote. The music is reserved for the demon is still there, pop scares, but no, it just goes to the credits. Yeah. Well, no, it goes to a title card that says six months later, Ebony got her kids back and we're like, oh, well, I guess no happy ending. That is a sad ending. That is the pop scare. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Right. The ominous music was accurate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, There you go. We found it. Yeah. Well, and then this is so fucking weird. After the title card, the movie's like, ooh, ooh, and another thing, right? Like it's getting the (laughs) Occam Award. Yeah. And, and it says, <laughs> just for you, Marsh. And, and we cut to like Ebony driving her kids to Philadelphia. And they're like, why are we going to Philadelphia? And she's like, I talked to your dad. I think we're going to work things out after all. And I'm like, oh, were you having problems with the dad? I thought he was just in Iraq. 
<laughs> well, that was the problem is he would have come back. Yeah, the right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so and then that scene is over and the movie gets a different title card, a second go at that. And it tells us like, you know, the real name of the lady was this. And then that house got demolished and and it's still kind of creepy even to this day. Strange things happen in Pittsburgh to this day. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so our story was inspired by the life of this lady and presumably the lie she told. And then it then it sort of shows the house. It's like, but there was a house. So, you know, <laughs> uh, that's proof. So at least that's part spooky. of her story was house true. Existed. She did have a house. Hmm? <laughs> You're saying there's no such thing as houses? You sound ridiculous. <laughs> All right, so I guess that's going to do it for a review of The Deliverance, but it's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still do need to punish ourselves more. So, Eli, tell us, what's on deck? Well, Noah, our Halloween spooktacular may be over, but something even scarier is on the horizon. That's right. It's election day oh, here in the United be, yeah. States. Yeah. So we'll be reminding folks just how spooktacular their November could be with Dinesh D'Souza's documentary, 2,000 mules. Oh, for fuck's sake. And I, that was bound to happen eventually, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 480 <laughs> to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Marsh for all his help this week. Be sure to check the show notes for links to more stuff from him. And a perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving us a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing A, The Citation, D&D D Minus, and The Skeptic Ride available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawful movies at gmail.com. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of the Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a check of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Positive, I'm Delusions. Promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. True to his word, the director of this movie destroyed whatever blackmail material he must have had on Glenn Close to get <laughs> it to do this movie. <laughs> The local police accepted it was a demon again as an excuse for Ebony having a second dead lady in her house way too quickly. <laughs> Pittsburgh remains filled with demons to this day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I Weird system they've got there. Yeah. So 100%. the problem is I had like 20 minutes left in the movie. So I was like, I'm going to get high. I'm a good boy. I deserve it. And then my I got stuck on the thought of why does God keep giving demons their magic? Because they're his powers. Right. Yes. He's the source <laughs> yep. of the so powers. he's mm. doing it. That's the problem with the omniscience and the omnipotence is that God is the one slamming kids against walls. <laughs> yep. If you really think about That's it. Right? Yeah. PSE and G is providing the power. <laughs> <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2024, all rights reserved.